We are so thankful that you have made the choice to tune in for one of ACC's messages. You know, as you're listening and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. If you're sitting at your phone or at your computer, hop on social media and be sure to use the hashtag, you belong at ACC, as God is teaching you different things during this message. You belong at ACC and we truly mean that, which means that we would love to have you join us during one of our Sunday services at 710 Aqua Heart Road. We would love to have you jump into this message and we are believing God is going to do some awesome things in your life today. Hey, we are in the, the second, or thir- sorry, the third week of our origin series today. And what we talked about on week one, we talked about the beginning of time, right? Where all kind of things in the natural world started. On the second week, Pastor John last week talked about the beginning of sin, how everything was good, and then we took things in our own hands and broke everything. And today, we got a lot of ground to cover. We're going to cover Genesis chapter 4 all the way through Genesis chapter 8, all right? So I hope you're ready with me to to cover a lot of ground. Uh, Many of you probably know the story of Noah and the flood, and the kind of how God renewed all things, uh, started over. We're going to talk about that this morning and cover some hard things. So I'm excited that you are here with us. All right. So to, I'm going to give you a, a brief overview of a few of the chapters. Genesis chapter 4 is where we start seeing the consequences of our sin nature. The fact that each of us has been born with this thing called a sin nature, the way I like to to phrase it, is that all of us in this room have been born bent. We have this bend in us that leans away from God's good plan for us. Instead of doing things God's way, naturally, we instead, if left to our own choices and our own passions and our own desires, we tend to do things not God's way. That's a bend away from goodness. And we see the beginning of that in chapter 4 when Cain kills his brother Abel. Right? Cain kills his brother Abel. And by the way, this thing called sin nature that each of us has in this room, this bent that we have away from goodness, this is why, okay, listen to this, this is why it's terrible advice when someone tells you to just follow your heart. It's terrible advice. I want you to know this because if left to your own choices, if you're just leaning into what makes you happy, you're always going to go away from where God wants you to go. Instead, you're going to go your own way. You're going to be leaning away from God's good plan for your life. This is also why it shows a lot of ignorance when people justify certain sin in their life by saying this phrase, this is the way God made me. And think about this for a moment. Let me give you my own personal example. If I look at my own family history, on my dad's side, both of my dad's parents were alcoholics. My grandmother actually died from alcoholism. Her parents and his parents, my grandmother and grandfather's parents, my great-grandparents, all of them were alcoholics. This is something that is just kind of, you look at probably my genetic makeup. If you look at the way, you ready for this? The way God made me. Uh, God made me probably prone to alcoholism, prone to addictive behavior, prone to self-soothing. These are just parts of the way that God made me, right? I have a sin nature that makes me lean away from God's good plan for my life. Now, how silly would it be if I just told you, you know what? God made me this way, so I'm just going to, you know, it must be what God wants for my life. I'm just going to drink and drink and drink and be an alcoholic. It's the way God made me. You would all think that was silly, right? You'd be like, that's not a good plan. That's not good for you. And likewise, you don't ever want to lean into something in your life just because it makes you happy. Just because it feels right. Just because it's the way God made you. All of us were born. When God created all things, he made it good. But then when sin entered the world, we had this natural bend away from God's good plan. So don't forget that. In fact, before Cain killed his brother Abel, God said this to Cain in Genesis chapter 4 verse 7. It says, sin is crouching at the door, eager to control you, but you must subdue it and be its master. 
In other words, in order for you to do things the right way, for you to do things God's way, it's going to require a certain amount of self-control. Instead of doing things the way that feels right and feels good, you're going to have to subdue those natural tendencies in order to do things God's way, which, by the way, brings a lot of happiness and a lot of joy into your life. Now, we know that Cain didn't subdue sin, right? He, he allowed anger to, to swell up, and, and he ended up killing his brother, Abel. And we see the first lesson I want to give you today about the flood. I'm going to give you the first part of number one is this. Sin begets sin. In other words, because of this sin nature that we uh, inherited from Genesis chapter 3, each of us now has this, this sin problem, and our ancestors before us all had this problem. Adam passed it along to Cain and Abel and Seth, and then uh, their other children, and it's been passed along for generation to generation. Sin begets more sin. That's the thing that you're going to see as you keep reading in, in chapter 4. It goes through Seth or Cain and Seth's family line. And then in Genesis chapter 5, we see this also. Let me tell you what happens at the very first part of Genesis chapter 5. The first two verses say this. This is the written account of the descendants of Adam. When God created human beings, he made them to be like himself. He created them male and female. And he blessed them and called them humans. So what we have right here is a recap we understand that God made everything in Genesis chapter 1 and 2, and it was good. And then he created human beings in his own image, and it was very good. And then he said, don't touch this tree, and don't eat from it. And we went over and we ate from it, and now we broke everything. And this problem of sin, we're now going to trace. So Genesis chapter 5 starts with, God made everything and it was good. And then we're going to see how sin begets sin. You ready? Essentially what happens as you read through verses 3 through 32, you're going to read about the history of Adam's family line. And here's what you're going to notice. It's going to mention a person. It's going to say Adam lived, in this case, for 930 years and then he died. We don't learn much more. We just know the person's name the number of years they lived, and then they died. And then it goes on to the next person, right? Seth lived for this many years, and then he died. And the next person lived, and then he died. And we're going to establish a pattern, right? What happens because of our sin? All of us are going to die. That's the problem with sin. It passes itself down from generation to generation through just a, the fact that we're humans with this nature of sin. And all of us are going to die for our sin. There's a pattern that's been established here in Genesis chapter 5. This person lives for this many years and then they die. It's a reoccurring theme. But then there seems to be a break in the pattern towards the end of the chapter. We meet this guy named Enoch, who's part of this family line. Here's what it says about Enoch in chapter 5, verse, uh, sorry, verse uh, 23 and 24. It says, Enoch, right, all these people, they lived and they died, they lived and they died, they lived and they died, they lived and they died. And then it says, Enoch lived 365 years, walking in close fellowship with God. Then one day he died. No, it doesn't say that. Right? Enoch breaks the pattern somehow. It doesn't say that Enoch died. It says that he disappeared because God took him. How amazing is that? Enoch is one of two people in the Bible that actually we know never die. God takes them before they die. Enoch and Elijah. We're going to talk about those two guys in just a second. But here's the main point. If you take number one, remember if you're taking notes, number one is that sin begets sin. You ready for this? But faithful living breaks patterns. Faithful living breaks patterns. You have all these guys who are not living faithfully. They were not walking with God and they lived and they died. They lived and they died. And then you have Enoch and it says Enoch walked in faithfulness with God and God took him up. He disappeared. He never died. He breaks this pattern. It's pretty amazing. 
I was telling you there's two people in the Bible who seemingly don't die, that God saves them from an earthly death. Yet the Bible also teaches us that all of us are sinners and that the wages of our sin is death. So you got to ask the question, how did these two guys get out of the punishment? Why do they not have to die? I don't quite know the answer to that question, but I'll tell you what I believe about a passage that you'll read if you go to the other end of the Bible, if you go all the way to the book of Revelation. In the book of Revelation, you learn about two witnesses that God is going to send from heaven down to this earth. They're going to be humans, and they're going to be witnesses that go out into the world and share the gospel, and eventually these two witnesses are going to be martyred and killed for their faith. And I believe those two witnesses are most likely going to be, guess who? Enoch and Elijah. Because they haven't yet had the punishment of death. I don't know if I'm right on that, but that's just a little fun factoid for you. But here's the point I really want to make about Enoch and how he was able to break this pattern. It says that Enoch walked in close fellowship with God. And one of the things I do on Fridays is every Friday I have a daddy-daughter date scheduled on my calendar. So uh, there'll be a, you know, one Friday I'll take out Michaela, and the next Friday I'll go out with Madeline and then Molly, and we'd kind of repeat that process. And one of the things we do, we'll go out to eat somewhere or go out to do something fun. You know, Madeline and I, last time we went out, we went to, we went to the batting cages. Uh, they were broken. That was a, kind of a bummer, right? But we, we think of something fun to do together. And... Uh, one of the things we do when we're walking from the car to a restaurant or something, I like to hold their hand. I like to just walk side by side with them and we walk together to wherever we're going because we're on a date. And one day I hope that there's a boy in their life that wants to treat them the way I treat them when I take them on a date. And, and so what we do though, we're walking together. We're walking in close fellowship with one another. And what it says about Enoch is that Enoch walked in close fellowship with God. You know, sometimes we can get overwhelmed with the future. We can think, I don't know what God wants me to do a month from now. I don't know what he wants me to do five years from now, 20 years from now. I have no idea what God's plan is for my life. Well, guess what? You can follow Enoch's plan and just say, I I don't quite know what's in the future. Enoch didn't get to live to be 900 like everyone else. He only got to live to his 300s. But here's what we know, that he knew to take, I don't know what's coming tomorrow or the next day or the next day, but he decided just to take the next step in fellowship with God. And what you can do in your life in order to break the pattern of sin, maybe even generational sin, maybe you're the generation in your family that you can look back and see this pattern of sin and say, you know what I'm going to do instead is I am going to walk in close fellowship with God. I don't know what I'm going to do a year from now, but I know today I'm going to take this next step with God by my side. And in doing so, you can start breaking the patterns of sin. You can start breaking patterns. And that's one of the things we learn from Enoch. And then we get into Genesis chapter 6. And we're working through this pretty quickly. Now, Genesis chapter 6, the first two verses are some of the most confusing verses in Scripture. If you have your Bible open, I'm not going to put them up on the screen. If you want to know what I'm talking about, you can open up your your copy of God's Word and look at it. But you get this whole thing about the sons of God wanting to marry and have sex with the daughters of man. What in the world does that mean? What does it mean that the sons of God are wanting to marry the daughters of of man? Listen, I, I, I have... Three possible options of what's going on in that passage of Scripture. And I could spend the next hour just talking about those three things. And I would love to share them with you, but I don't have enough time to get into that today. So if you're like, hey, I really want to know more about 6 verses 1 and 2, would you tell me more? Come talk to me afterwards, okay? It's quite confusing, but I will boil it down to this. And by the way, if you're wondering, do you know which one of the three is right? I don't. I have no idea, okay? It's not that important. The important thing is that From the very beginning, when God promised, after the fall, God made a promise to Satan that one day a descendant of Eve was going to crush his head. And from that moment on, Satan is trying to do everything he can to delay and or stop that from ever happening. And so Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, is, a, is part of that story of, of, of spiritual warfare, of Satan trying to slow down this process and making things more and more evil. 
And then we get to verse 3. Genesis chapter 6, verse 3. It says, Then the Lord said, My spirit will not put up with humans for such a long time, for they are only mortal flesh. In the future, their normal lifespan will be more, no more than 120 years. So now you got to ask the question, what is this 120-year lifespan thing? What's that about? Does it mean that from now on, instead of people living 600, 700, 900 years, that people will live more like about 120 years? And that's going to be the max? That if you're 119 years old and 364 days, you're like, whoo, tonight's the night. God made a promise. Like, that's, that's not actually what this is saying, because we actually read in Scripture that after this moment, people lived beyond 120 years. So what, what is actually, when you read this verse in context... What God is saying here in this moment is from this moment that God spoke this, these words, there's going to be 120 years until he wipes out all of his creation. He gives us this window of time, and that actually leads us to this, this next point, this concept of 120 years. Lessons from the flood, number two, God always provides an opportunity for repentance. God always provides an opportunity for you to repent from your sin. Oftentimes we, we remember that God commanded Noah to build an ark. That's true, right? God did command Noah to build a huge boat. But do you know that God actually asked Noah to do more than just build a boat? We actually read about it in the New Testament. In 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 5, and I'm going to add on to that verse 9. It says, and God did not spare the ancient world except for Noah and the seven others in his family. And then it says this, Noah warned the world of God's righteous judgment. It says, so God protected Noah when he destroyed the world of ungodly people with a vast flood. So you see, the Lord knows how to rescue godly people from their trials, even while keeping the wicked under punishment until the day of final judgment. But that, that part in there, it says, Noah warned the world. Where, where does it say that? Uh, yeah, no, Noah warned the world of God's righteous judgment. Uh, here, here's what we know about that verse. That Noah, he had about, there was about a 20-year period from when God said there's going to be a 120-year span. There was about 20 years until God commanded Noah to build this boat. And then from that moment, there was 100 years that Noah was actually building the ark. A 100-year period of time. And what we know from this verse in 2 Peter, that Noah wasn't just building a boat. He had another job to do while he was building the boat. And that was to warn all the people of the earth to repent. Hey, y'all, there's this flood coming, and it's going to come in 100 years, and I'm building this boat, and you need to repent of your sin. God gave the world 100 years to turn from their sin and wickedness. Noah was warning people and preaching a gospel of repentance. Imagine for a moment that you're in your house. Let's assume you have a two-story home, okay? You're upstairs, and at 3 in the morning, you hear some, some people in your house. It'd be a scary moment, right? I'll tell you what I would do, right? I'd go grab my gun. I'd load it, I'd make sure there's one in the chamber, and I'd go to the top of my stairs. I don't want to hurt anybody. I don't want to hurt anybody. I'd go to the top of my stairs, and I would yell down so that anybody downstairs can hear me. I'm here, and I have a gun, and it's loaded, and I know how to use it, and I'm coming downstairs in two minutes with it. And if you're still in my home, I'm going to use it. And what I'm doing in that moment is simply saying, whatever you got, Whatever you're holding on to, if you've already got the TV off the wall, fine. Get out of the house. you got two minutes. I don't want to hurt anybody. And what God is doing in this moment is he's saying, Noah, give people, I'm going to give everybody an opportunity to repent. They're going to have 100 years to turn from their evil ways and instead join you in righteousness. But they didn't. Nobody listened. In fact, it says in 1 Peter 3.20, It says that God waited patiently while Noah built the ark. I didn't put that on the screen, but that's what it says in 1 Peter 3.20, that God waited patiently while Noah built the ark. God wanted people to repent of their sin. 
He didn't surprise anybody. You see, God used Noah to preach repentance, but they did not listen. Here's a third thing that we should learn from the flood. The third thing is that God grieves over our sin. Did you know that? Did you know that when there's sin in your life, that it grieves the heart of God? That it's something that that causes grief to him. And I think this makes sense to you. If you're a parent in this room and you have a good plan for your children and you've orchestrated things so that they can thrive and instead of sticking with the plan, they go off and do something that they shouldn't do. They go off and do something kind of dumb, right? And you, you watch them and you know they're not dumb, but for some reason they're acting in their sin nature. They're doing something they're not supposed to do. And it breaks your heart as a parent to watch them do it because you know it's not what's good for them. And God does the same thing. He looks at his creation and he knows what's good for us and it grieves his heart. It says in chapter 6 verse 5, The Lord observed the extent of human wickedness on the earth. And he saw that everything, listen to this, that everything they thought or imagined was consistently and totally evil. They couldn't even muster up a good idea. They couldn't muster up a godly thought. It says, so the Lord was sorry he ever made them and put them on the earth. It broke his heart. What I want you to glean from this one verse is what I just said, is that God grieves over our sin. When we have sin in our life, it breaks his heart. It says that everything they thought or even imagined was consistently and totally evil. And he regretted ever making humans Let's look at the fourth thing I want to show you. Lessons from the flood. Number four, God is always motivated by love, even if we struggle to see it. God is always motivated by love, even if we struggle to see it. Real fast, I'm just going to take a quick poll in this room. How many of you believe that God is loving? Make some noise if you believe God's loving. All right. So we, if you're a follower of Jesus, right, you probably would say, "Woo! I believe that I follow a loving God. That makes sense to you. But what happens sometimes is there's passages in Scripture that were like, "Woo! That's, comp- that's hard to put next to the fact I just said God is loving and God's yet about to wipe out the entirety of his creation, regret that he ever made them and kill them all in one fell swoop with this flood. How does that fit with God being loving? I don't understand. So what we do is we're like, I believe God's loving, so I'm just going to kind of pretend and not read that passage very often because it's hard to understand, and we just put it aside. But the truth is that we can actually read the hard parts of Scripture knowing that God is loving and be able to see in it where is the love in this. That God, if God is loving, then how is a global flood loving? Because God is loving. He's just. It must be. And so let's keep reading. In verse 7, it says, And the Lord said, I will wipe this human race I have created from the face of the earth. Yes, and I will destroy every living thing, all the people, the large animals, the small animals that scurry along the ground, and even the birds of the sky. I am sorry I ever made them. How is that loving? How is it loving for God to create something and then let it get so messed up that everything, well, what's going on? Like, how is this loving? And, and let me explain to you why I think this was a loving act of God. God is watching his creation. He's watching people made in his image rape each other, murder each other, hurt each other. All these vile things that they're doing to each other. He's watching his creation treat his other creation in these ways. And it breaks his heart so much and that he just wants to see it stop. And the only way he can cause this evil that's happening within this, this, these people, the free-thinking people that get to lean into God or lean into their own bent, the only way to stop it is to say, I'm just going to put an end to it and wipe them out. I can't watch these people hurt each other anymore. And they can't hurt each other if they're gone. Now, some of you might be thinking, well, well, doesn't, you know, at worst, doesn't that make God a murderer? Or at best, doesn't that God, make God like a proponent of euthanasia? Like, ah, I just, I don't want to see them hurt anymore, so I'm just going to take them out. 
It might seem like that, but it's actually going to lean into my next point. And it's this. Lesson number five is that God is the giver and taker of life. God is the giver and the taker of life. What does this mean? Here's what it means. God cannot murder anybody. God chooses when you live and God chooses when you die. If you leave here today and on your way out in the parking lot, you collapse dead from a heart attack. God didn't murder you in that moment because he's the one who decides when to take your life. And if he chooses to do it right then, that's what happens. He takes your life. He, you can only murder someone if you take a life that you don't have the authority to take. God has the authority to take your life anytime he wants. So he can't murder anyone. He's not a, a murderer. He's a giver and a taker of life. In 1 Samuel 2, it says, The Lord gives both death and life. He brings some down to the grave, but raises others up. How about in Psalm 90, verse 3, it says, You turn people back to dust, saying, Return to dust, you mortals. See, God gets to choose when life ends, and he can't murder anybody. And if the most loving thing he can do is to end the life of all the people on earth except for Noah and seven family members and some, some, uh, a male and female of multiple different animals to, to con renew life on earth. Then that's the most loving thing to do because God is loving. God is right and God is good and God is just. And so then Noah enters the picture. God has this plan. He knows that he's going to end and wipe out all his creation. And then we get to meet this guy named Noah in verse 8. It says, But Noah found favor with the Lord. This is the account of Noah and his family. Noah was a righteous man, the only blameless person living on earth at the time. And he walked in close fellowship with God. Now, does this verse mean that Noah was a perfect man, a sinless man? We know that that's not right, right? We know that in the book of Timothy, when, the, when God tells Timothy how to call overseers and elders into the church, it says, pick men who are blameless. I'll tell you what, all the overseers of this church are sinners, right? None of them are absolutely 100% blameless. Your pastors, I, I, man, I, I have a hard time getting through breakfast without thinking, doing, saying something I shouldn't. Right? All of us are messed up people. So this isn't saying that Noah was perfect. It's saying that Noah was a man of integrity. That Noah uh, was seen in his community as being a, above reproach. That he was a man of good reputation. That no one would find fault in him. Not that he was perfect. And then so what God does next is he gives Noah... In, in Genesis chapter 6, if you read 11 all the way through verse 21, God gives Noah some very specific instructions. And if you were to read those verses, you would see that God observes that there's a bunch of corruption in the world. And then he says to Noah, I want you to build a boat. And then he tells Noah exactly how to build that boat. He says, I want it to be 450 feet long and 75 feet wide and 45 feet high. And I want you to do this. And I want there to be three levels. And I want there to be a tar and pitch. I want you to do cypress wood. And he gives all these instructions to Noah on how to build this boat. And that's why I want to show you the, the sixth thing that we're going to learn from this encounter that Noah has with God Number six, lessons from the flood. We should obey God even when the world thinks we're crazy. Believer, look at me. You should obey God even if the world thinks you're crazy. Noah was commanded to build a boat in the middle of the desert. No doubt his contemporaries were standing around watching him gathering wood and tar and writing out this plan and, and having this whole thing and starting to put this thing together. And they were thinking, what in the world is going on with Noah? He has lost his mind because there he is doing what doesn't make any sense, but God asked him to do it and he chose to obey God. In fact, verse 22 says, so Noah did everything exactly the way God had commanded him. The size of the boat, the height of the boat, the width of the boat, the materials of the boat, the levels of the boat. Noah did everything 
exactly the way God told him to do it. You know, in this life, there are going to be people who don't understand why you do things differently than they do. Why when you stand up for righteousness, when you stand up for people, when you give towards causes that are important to the heart of God, when you serve, when you, you, you're going to do a lot of things that the world looks out, uh, looks in on your life and says, that is crazy. Why are you doing that? In Deuteronomy 31, verse 6, it says, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid and do not panic before them, for the Lord your God will personally go ahead of you. He will never fail you nor abandon you. You know, sometimes the best response to someone who's a skeptic of what God has asked you to do or what God says he's going to do, sometimes the best response to a skeptic is just patience. Because eventually God is going to show himself always faithful and exactly what he says is going to happen is going to happen. In Genesis chapter 7, very first verse, it says this, when everything was ready, remember Noah was building a boat for a hundred years. He was preaching a gospel of repentance to the world for a hundred years. When everything was ready, the Lord said to Noah, now go into the boat with all your family for among all the people of the earth, I can see that you alone are righteous. You see, the world had an opportunity to repent, but he's looking back at that moment saying, Noah, your gospel of repentance, it didn't work. Nobody believed you. And now you and seven from your family, your wife, your three sons and their wives, get on this boat along with the animals I've commanded you to bring and we're gonna do this thing. They had that opportunity. And then it goes on in verse four. It says, seven days from now, I will make the rains pour down on the earth. And it will rain for 40 days and 40 nights until I have wiped from the earth all the living things I have created. So Noah did everything the Lord commanded him. If you keep reading in this chapter, you're going to see that that Noah, again, did exactly what he was asked to do. He gets on the boat, he brings his wife, he takes his three sons and their wives, and they take uh, two of each kind of animal. If you wonder what that means, right? He wasn't asked to bring two of every species of animal. You follow biology a little bit, you know that there's kingdom at the top, and then at the bottom you have genus and species of animals. Well, he's asked right above that is that family line. He was asked to bring two of every kind of animal, two felines, not necessarily two cats and two tigers and two lions and two, two feline kinds on the boat. So he would have brought on the boat about 1,400 kinds of animals, about 6,800 animals in total on this boat as God had commanded. If you want to see how that's possible, what three layers and a boat that size looks like, and how do you fit all the animals on this thing, go to Kentucky and go to the Ark Encounter. It's pretty epic. But like God, like God said, the flood came 40 days, 40 nights. Genesis 7 verse 19. All the, the flood is coming, right? And it says, finally, the water covered even the highest mountains on the earth rising more than 22 feet above the highest peaks. All the living things on earth died. Birds, domestic animals, wild animals, small animals that scurry along the ground, and all the people, everything that breathed and lived on dry land died. Here's the, the last lesson I want to show you from the flood. Number seven is that God's promises can always be trusted. God's promises can always be trusted. You guys believe that? I was expecting some more amens today. <laughs> Either because something I said was really good or the Ravens scored a touchdown. And some of you, you know you're keeping an eye on that score right now, right? <laughs> well, listen, when God says something's going to happen, it's going to happen. When God says something isn't going to happen, it's not going to happen. You can go to the bank. Put all your money down on it, right? God's promises can be trusted. Think about this for a moment. The, the ark was built by amateurs. The Titanic was built by professionals. And here's the point behind this. When God tells Noah, hey, 
amateur Noah. You've never built a boat, maybe never even seen a boat in your life. I want you to build this thing, and here's the dimensions, and here's the material. He didn't get a whole bunch of instruction, but he knew in that moment, God's made a promise, and when God asks me to do something, I can trust him. I can do it, and God's going to pull through. You know, we, we met Andre and uh, Rena up here just a little bit ago. When God says, I want you to build 55 houses for the pygmy people, and you've got zero dollars to work with. And he says, all right, I'm going to do it. And now here we are celebrating that God can always, whatever God promises, he's going to do. And so when God tells Noah, build an ark as an amateur, I'm going to make this thing, you know, not sink. That's exactly what happens. In Genesis 8, Verses one through five, it says, but God remembered Noah. Remember, they're up there in this boat and all the wild animals and livestock with him. And he sent a wind to blow across the earth and the flood waters began to recede. The ground water, uh, the underground water stopped flowing and the torrential rains from the sky were stopped. So the flood waters gradually receded from the earth. After 150 days, exactly five months from the time the flood began, the boat came to rest on the mountains of Ararat. Two and a half months later, as the waters continued to go down, other mountain peaks became visible. And then what happens if you continue to read this story, and I recommend that you do it on your own, the animals, they open the door, and the animals and the humans, they exit the boat and begin to repopulate and renew God's plan on earth. You see, what happens next is Noah, imperfect Noah, he gets off this boat, and he has this time with God, and God makes a promise in Genesis chapter 8, verse 20. It says, then Noah built an altar to the Lord, and there he sacrificed as burnt offerings, the animals and birds that had been approved for that purpose. And the Lord was pleased with the aroma of the sacrifice and said to himself, I will never again curse the ground because of the human race. Even though everything they think or imagine is bent, there's that word, is bent towards evil from childhood, I will never again destroy all living things. Remember, what God promises will happen will happen. What God promises will never happen again, will never happen again. Will God ever flood this earth with a global flood ever again? No. He promised right here he's never going to do it. And then even if you go on, as, as God makes these, these promises, right? God makes an even better promise. <laughs> if you think about it, God makes an even better promise. Uh, in Genesis chapter 9, verse 3. You've maybe never seen this before. But God says this about the animals of the world. I have given them to you for food. How many of you love Mission Barbecue as much as I do? <laughs> right there, all right? If you're a vegan or a vegetarian, I don't want to hear it, okay? <laughs> God says in Genesis chapter 9, verse 3, I have given the animals that walk around on, and fly around and swim around on this earth, I've given them to you for food to eat. Just like I have the vegetables and the, the fruits of the trees, the grain. And then what happens next is God puts a rainbow in the sky. By the way, the, the true meaning of the rainbow. God puts a rainbow in the sky to seal the promise he's made to remind us that when God makes a promise, we can always count on him. In fact, I want to encourage you, every time you see a rainbow in the sky, just be reminded in that moment that when God makes a promise, he always comes through. He always follows through. So what do we do with this? Right, as we ask God each day, each Sunday, what, what we're supposed to do with his word, what now, God? I want to ask you to consider something in this room. And here's the, the thing that the Holy Spirit has put on my heart to share with you that you might need to consider this morning as a what now God moment. And here it is. You ready? Don't miss the boat. Now you might be sitting here thinking, wait, God promised never flood the earth again. What boat are you talking about? There's another boat? I'm supposed to get on it? I'm not talking about a literal boat. In fact, one of the things I love about the ark encounter when you're in Kentucky and you're looking at this ark and you're on the inside, if you remember, when God gave no instructions, 
Do you know how many doors the ark had on it? The instructions were really clear. One door. And what the ark encounter has done is they have this projector and on that door they've projected the image of a cross. And it's such a really powerful reminder that Jesus says, right, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father. No one is going to be saved from judgment except for through me. The only way to be saved from coming judgment in your life. Back in Noah's day, you had to repent and get on the boat. You had to go through the door. For us, there's no more boat, no more flood. But the way to be saved from the coming punishment for our sins is through the door of the cross. We can get on the boat by saying, God, I want you to be the Lord of my life. I want to repent of my sin. I want to turn from my bent and do things your way as best as I can. God, would you save me? In John 14, when you think about this, the, the ark must have been kind of a, a, a cramped quarters. Put 6,800 animals in one three-story cruise ship, right? It's going to be kind of crowded. But this is what God says about the door that you can walk through. He says, don't let your hearts be troubled. This is Jesus speaking. He says, trust in God and trust also in me. There are more than enough rooms in my father's house. If this were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? When everything is ready, I will come and get you so that you will always be with me where I am. You see, Jesus says that there is more than enough room to walk through the door. Everyone in this room, there's more than enough room for you to walk through the doors of repentance and into a new life in Christ. There's more room in heaven than you can ever imagine. We're not all going to cram on a boat together. We're going to be able to spend eternity together in, in God's home in heaven. And Matthew 25 warns us also. It says, so you too must keep watch for you do not know when that day or hour of my return will be. Church, listen, if you're in this room right now and you've never made a decision to, to walk through the door, to go through the narrow gate, to allow Jesus to be the path that brings you back into, instead of have the coming judgment and death that happens outside the ark, but to be saved from judgment inside the ark, I want to encourage you, don't let today end without talking to me, talking to someone with a lanyard on, talking to one of our pastors, talking to one of our prayer, whoever you got to talk to and say, listen, I need to figure out how do I walk in this boat? How do I get on this boat? And we'd be happy to talk through that with you and show you what that step looks like and how to, to walk through those initial steps of obedience. Let's pray together. God, thank you for your book. Thank you for this revelation you've given to us. You show us in your word where all things come from. As we study our origins, it's helpful to know that the natural world began at your command. And then because you love us so much, you gave us free choice to do things our way or your way. And we chose to do things our way. And we broke, we broke a lot about your creation. We broke a lot about our relationship with you. And we deserve death. Just as everyone on the outside of the ark deserved death. Father, yet you love us so much, you give us an opportunity to not only be uh, like you did it with Noah to renew the world, but you give us an opportunity to renew our lives by walking through the door, walking through the narrow gate of repentance that is Jesus Christ. Would you allow anyone in this room that needs to walk through that gate? Would you allow them the courage to say something, to do something, to put something on a connect card today and let us know they want to do that? God, we love you and we thank you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we are so thankful for the truth that was shared in this message today. Please know that we, as a church, are praying that what you have learned today, the truths that God has put deep into your heart, will manifest themselves and grow themselves into something amazing. And as always, you can experience that with other believers, other people who are walking this walk of faith at ACC on Sunday mornings. Please remember this, you belong at ACC.